Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, gonna do a short video here of my first listening impressions of this R8 and some of the tube rolling I did and some thoughts I have on this amp and some things we're going to try to fix some of the problems that I saw when I was initially testing and listening to this. So one of the first things I'm going to go over is some tube rolling and like I said in the last video and if you haven't watched it you should even if you're not interested in the repair part of it you should watch the Audio Analyzer Suite review of the performance of this amp. And yes, in ultralinear mode, it makes the advertised 45 watts per channel, which is awesome to see a Made in China amp that actually meets the specs that it's advertised at. This is the first one. Try to A12 and an A50 Rice Song. Neither one of those were within even 10% of their advertised power. Same thing with the Noob Sound 6P1. It's advertised as, I think, a 6.8 watt amp. Doesn't even make two. And so, really glad to see that this one actually makes the power that it's advertised at. And then, the output transformers performed well. I mean, I have no idea what these actually are inside. They're, you know, potted transformers. But, looking at the frequency response curve versus THD, they're doing their job and so they're not a problem like we've seen with some other made in china amps we'll say that this amp that my friend bought he bought it with the like baseline wilsonton branded tubes and the output tubes i'm not sure what they were made they got their name on them they really just didn't sound that great i swapped in out of necessity because one of them got red plated and cooked with the problem this amp had that these gold lion kt88s sound much better they sound richer because i had a pair of the original wilsonton tubes so i could have it one channel then the other and then listen to them comparing them to each other the gold lions definitely sound richer they have smoother bass they have more detail, they have just better overall performance from one end of the spectrum to the other. And I know these are kind of pricey, I think they're, right now they're probably over $100 each, and if you try to get a match quad, you're probably going to spend $500, but they really did make a nice improvement to the amp. I mean, there are some other options out there. The other thing I want to try rolling into it is some JJEL34L tubes. I've had good luck with those in single ended amps and I'm not sure most people really need all the power that these KT88 tubes make. And so that might be a good option for on a budget to get a cleaner, smoother sounding amp. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of power this amp makes stepping down to EL34L tubes. And so we're going to be doing that in a future video. So I did roll in some different driver tubes. And here were the tubes that came in it. There's some Wilsonton branded, looks like some made in Russia tubes. And these are the, let me get the numbers off these, 6HHC. I've listened to these before. These are the Russian equivalents of 6SN7s. These are normally pretty good sounding tubes. And they don't sound bad in this amp either. You could do a whole lot worse. But I will say that the Sylvania Tall Bottle tubes from the 60s, in late 50s, early 60s, are some really sweet sounding tubes. But they're priced accordingly. People really are asking a lot for those tubes now because they know they're really good sounding tubes. And people are looking for them. Now another tube I had that in an SE amp... I didn't like quite as much as the Sylvanias, but were still good sounding. But I think in this amp, because the 6S and 7s are used as the phase splitter and they're not the actual preamp tube, it's not quite as critical. And let me get one of these out so I can keep forgetting what these things are called. These were National Electronics 
6S and 7 GTB made in USSR. And great plate, two holes. These are pretty decent sounding tubes. And I feel like that they're probably some old stock tongue saws since it says made in USSR. I'm not sure exactly what company makes these, but anyway, these are probably a third of the price of what some Sylvanias would cost you. And given that they're not in a prime location or they're not doing a prime job in this amp, something like this will be fine. I did try some PS Vane CV-181s that the guy who bought this amp got, and I didn't like them as much as these uh, GTBs that I put in here. So anyway, the PS Vanes were a step up from these Russia tubes. Now for the 6SL7s, these are 6H9Cs. Again, these are OTK, new old stock Russian tubes. Not bad for what they are, but I tried some GE short bottle, you know, the, the silver plate tubes, and these really sound good. I tried two other kinds of 6SL7s, and they didn't sound as good as these little short bottle GE tubes, and they can be found real cheap. They're about 10 bucks on eBay. So, yeah, if you want to try some different 6SL7s, See if you can find a couple of these GE tubes and see what you think. I think they sounded really sweet. And given these are the drivers, they really make a difference in the way the amp sounds, much more so than the 6S and 7s do. The output tubes make more difference than these 6S and 7s do. So if I was going to be tube rolling, I would leave the 6S and 7s alone and try to find some 6SL7s you like and then get some good output tubes. Just my thought on that. The original tubes, it sounded shouty to me, especially like with horns, and it was real fatiguing to listen to the amp. Because I've got some clips, RP600Ms, which are fairly efficient speakers. I know I don't want to get into the whole argument of clips overrates the efficiency of their speakers, but they are really efficient speakers. And most of my little you know, two or three watt amps don't have any problem driving them. So I'm probably not using but a few watts of this amp. And so I'm using it down at the real low distortion levels. Not hearing any of the other issues that I'm going to get into in a minute that this amp has. But the tubes really do change it from being a fatiguing to listen to amp to being something smooth and enjoyable. So... It's not a real, you know, huge difference, but I wouldn't say it's subtle either. It's definitely an audible change rolling in some different driver tubes and output tubes. Again, phase splitters make a little bit of difference, but that wasn't huge, and I wouldn't spend a lot of money on those. The center guy, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what this guy's purpose is, and I need to kind of reverse engineer the wiring. The wiring schematics that I've found online for this amp are not wired the same way that this amp that I've got in front of me is. And I don't know if they change the way that they're wiring them, but that's good for a future video. I'm not going to get into that today. I did do a short listening test changing this tube out, and I didn't hear any difference. It didn't seem to have a whole lot of contribution to the sound of the amp but again i didn't spend a lot of time you know a b listening and so it may have a little subtle change but it's not going to have the big change that these 6s l7s did they're the main contributor in my opinion to the sound of the amp at least in the short time i've listened to it so let's get into the bad i've already covered the good nice sounding amp it's got a lot of power especially into efficient speakers, it's going to easily do what you need it to do. And you're not going to hear the bad that I ran into on high efficient speakers. Where you're going to run into this problem is if you've got some older, low efficient speakers that you're going to be needing, you know, 20 to 30 watts of power to drive them. Or if you start trying to drive it at those kind of decibel levels, if you've got a larger room that takes more 
you know, dBs out of the speakers to fill. I've got a fairly small listening space, and I'm only, you know, less than, you know, eight feet probably, maybe 10 feet from the speakers. And so I don't need a lot of power. What I ran into is there's some hum that this amplifier has. And once you get over about a third volume with no input signal, and I had the input shorted out, so it's not some problem, you know, from an open input. The input was shorted out when I was doing this test. There is some hum being generated from this amp. I believe it's from a couple of problems that I found. One is the way the heaters are run in this amp, or the heater wiring, that they've bundled it with all the signal wiring, which is just a no-no. You never do that. The heater wire should be run at 90 degrees to any signal wire, and it should be, you know, moved as far away as physically possible from any of the signal wires. When I build my own DIY amps, I usually have, like, the heaters and the signals on two different levels so that they're as far away from each other as possible. The other issue that I saw is they've got a really crazy way that they're running some of the grounds in this amp. One of them is they've got one of the heater wires referenced to ground, which I would rather create a virtual center tap with a couple of 100 ohm resistors and ground that to reference the heaters to ground. They grounded one leg, which is it's kind of a cheater way of doing it, of saving a couple of parts. But then they ground the cathode of the output tubes to one of the heater wires and have the signal path laid over the top of high current 6.3 volt AC, which is, I, I don't know what engineer thought that was a good idea. I've never seen that in another amp. And it's like, well, we don't want to spend the money on this piece of wire, and so we're just going to put this little jumper thing between a couple of the tube pins from the, you know, the cathode over to the heater wire. It's like, I, I have no idea why they did that. And to be grounding the bus, they've done kind of a combination of bus and star grounding, but they're not really using star grounding like they should by using separate ground wires from each of these buses directly to the star ground point. They're trying to do it through some wires that are already in the amp, which is just a really bad idea. And we're not talking about a ton of money here or even a hard to do modification. So one of the first things I'm going to be doing is trying to solve the grounding problems. The other thing that I haven't really dug into either is how they're grounding the bus that they have for the input driver face splitter, you know, this front section of tubes. They've got a ground bus that goes across, and it looks like they got one end of it grounded and then run across, bundled with a bunch of signal wires back to some ground point that may not even be the same ground point. I've also not really investigated how they have the safety ground from the IEC connector, whether they've got it connected straight to the chassis, whether they're trying to share a ground point with some other stuff. And so there's definitely some grounding issues. Don't know how the potentiometer's grounded. Don't know how they have the input you know, jacks grounded. And so obviously some weird stuff going on, not only with the hum, the weirdest thing happened was when I hooked up my tube phono stage to this amp. And I've been using this tube phono stage for at least a couple of years. I've had it hooked up to a dozen different amplifiers. Never seen this problem before. When I first switched the amp over to that source, it had a nasty hum. I mean, not just a subtle hum. It was like a nasty ground loop hum. And then... I started kind of playing around with it, trying to figure out what was going on. And it wasn't the cables, the interconnects or anything causing the problem. It was the ground wire from the turntable to the phono stage was picking up all kinds of crazy noise. And then when I moved it actually to a certain, you know, trying to move, when I'd move it around, I could hear the hum coming and going. When I would touch the insulation on the wire, put my hand over it, it would just totally go away. 
and then I'd take my hand off and it would get super loud again. And then when I moved it to one place, it actually started picking up a radio station, which I'm like, holy crap, I've never seen anything like this with my system or with that tube phono stage preamp. It's like, I don't know what's going on, but I have to assume that it's got something to do with the way the internal grounding is done in this amp that's not done or engineered right, and it's creating ground loops that then the tube phono stage is interacting with. And so I could see that same problem happening just with any kind of equipment. So that's definitely got to get fixed. And so that's something that we're going to cover. Shouldn't be rocket science or a real hard thing to resolve that problem. The other thing I noticed, if you select the preamp input, that that same hum is just there like if you had the volume knob turned up because I think the preamp's bypassing part of that circuitry. And again, don't know how that's all set up in this thing, but clearly with no input and with the jack shorted, there's a hum in this amp that shouldn't be there. And again, I think it's picking up the heater winding that and or there's a problem with them using these metal oxide resistors that are all in the signal path around the tube. And I never liked metal oxide resistors. I don't think they should be used in audio gear. Metal film resistors are much better. And I ordered a whole set of Viché high quality two watt metal film resistors. There's one resistor that's a three watt, and then we're gonna have one watt the 10 ohm resistors on the cathodes, I ordered some really high quality 0.5% precision resistors to go on there so the meter bias will be correct on each tube because any variance that's in that 10 ohm resistor would make the tubes end up imbalanced in their bias by the meter because that resistor is being used as a shunt for the meter to read off of. So that's definitely something that we're going to do first. And so I feel like, you know, step one is I'm going to go through and replace all those metal oxide resistors with metal film resistors. We're also going to fix this cap, which is the cap on the power supply. The last video I showed that when you power on the amp, it sees like 480 volts across this cap, and it's only rated at 450. So I got some 550 volt rated caps. You could get away with 500 volt ones and be safe. 450, the ones that are in here are really, I mean, they're probably gonna last for a while. And you know, I don't know if people are having problems with those exploding in here. And they're only getting over volted for probably 30 or 45 seconds until the output tubes start drawing current and then the voltage comes down. But it's still not a good idea to put capacitors that are rated at less voltage than what you know the circuit's going to see. And so, do this, metal film resistors. I want to see if that gets rid of some of this noise. I don't know if maybe what we're hearing, this what I'm hearing is hum, maybe more hiss than hum coming through those resistors, but I have a feeling it's got more to do with the way the heater wires are run and also the way that the grounding scheme is done is far from ideal. There's definitely some ground loops going on inside this amp. So again, if you're just running a DAC or a CD player and you're using efficient speakers, you're not gonna see any of these issues that I ran into. But then if you're running efficient speakers, you probably don't need KT88 tubes and 45 watts of power. So save your money and get some EL34 tubes would be my suggestion. But again, I need to try that myself before I make that recommendation. See what kind of power this thing puts out. Is it EL34 amp? See what it sounds like. And again, I feel like that if you really need this power, you're going to run into these issues that I ran into with the volume turned up of this hum. You could probably run into some of these issues with these ground loops, depending on the equipment that you have hooked up to this thing. And running the signal path from the output tubes through one of the heater wires is just a 
plain bad idea. So there's definitely some room for improvement in this, and I don't think it's going to take a whole lot to you know really get this thing singing. It already sounds really good. I know this thing's gotten some really good reviews on other channels, and in this instance, I tend to agree with them that this you know this is a good sounding amp, and this is a real bargain that you're getting output transformers that work this well, that the power transformer sized right, you're getting some beautiful chassis work, you know, nice looking knobs, the little lights on the knobs are really cool, it's got really high quality jacks, it's got nice big speaker jacks, the ones like I like using in my equipment, that's what they put on here. And so, I think for the money, this is a bargain, but is it perfect? Absolutely not. There's definitely some issues. I can see some engineering problems with the way they've done cost savings in it. I don't trust some of these caps that are in it. I don't like the resistors they're using. So we're going to fix this thing up. So anyway, that's kind of my initial feelings about this amplifier. So I think we're going to have some real fun with this R8 amp. And I know some of you folks probably tuning in for the first time when you saw this Wilteson R8 or maybe you've got one and wanted to see what you know Skokie had to say about it if you're enjoying this content please subscribe to the channel please like the video and we'll be doing some more R8 fun soon have a great day